Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Central Otago District Council meeting for the 9th of March. We're moving on to item 2229 on the agenda, which is found at page 300 and, uh, 304, and that's the William Fraser renovation paper. And Christina, the floor is yours. Kia ora, everyone. Um, so this report that I'm presenting today is to consider the options and um, the resulting potential um, additional funding required to do the final stage of the William Fraser um, renovation project, which is the main bathroom facilities, um, the hallway in between the staff room um, and uh, what we know as Nahui Fa, and plus the emergency management office as well. So we've looked at three options when going ahead with this project. Um, the first option is to go ahead with the design that we had um, when preparing the budgets for the long-term plan, um, which was um, a single sex um, toilet design. So quite sort of similar as to what we've got now, um, but incorporating in a accessible toilet and some shower in the men's, a shower in the men's and a shower in the ladies. And then we've also looked at doing a unisex toilet design. Um, now, when you sort of look around other commercial buildings um, in the area and around New Zealand, um, we're definitely moving towards more of the single sex um, toilet designs. Um, and finally, we looked at, hey, look, those two options above, um, we're going to do some additional, we would require some additional budget. So look, is there a way that we can get within budget? And there is, but that's a do an absolute minimum. Um, so just meeting the um, building consent requirements to finish off the project and basically do a paint um, throughout. So there are the three options that, we, that we've looked at and the recommendation that I'm putting forward today um, is is to actually go ahead with the unisex toilet design. Just got greater flexibility. It is the most expensive um, option of the three, but yeah, that greater flexibility is the diversity of our uh, staff and people coming into the building as well. Um, is, is becoming more diverse, which is fantastic. Um, we get floor to ceiling cubicles, which is um, a nice user experience um, as well. And so, yeah, any questions? You got me on the hop as I went and shut my <laughs> and I couldn't see, I could see that. I, I was within hearing at all times. I'm right, sure thank you. You're thank you, Christina. Well played. Questions, <laughs> councillors? Not seeing anything. I had a question. Christina, you said this is the final stage <laughs> for the William Fraser building. I do recall sometime in the past there was talk of double glazing the two long corridors, um, you know, the ones I mean. Is that now off the agenda? Because I don't see it here. No, that's um, actually running in a separate project. Um, it's by, um, we have budget in this financial year to do so, and we're just working through that one. Um, but that's actually been done as a separate project. It, it uses sort of, you know, specialist window suppliers um, and the joys of COVID <laughs> as well. Um, it is probably going to be delayed, um, but we are working through that, but as a separate project, and we're actually looking at double glazing the whole building um, as well to get the maximum, that uh, maximum efficiency. Well, the price of power, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Tracy. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I've only really got a comment, and I think this, I think they should just, you guys should just get on with it, because at the end of the day, you do it right, do it once, and then it's done for the next X amount of years. So I'm in favour of just getting it done. Do you want to get on with it by moving A and B then, Tracy? <laughs> I'll move A and B. <laughs> Somebody want to second that? I'll second that, oh. surely. Thank you, Shirley. And because I rushed that, is there any further question or comment before we go to a vote, councillors? Appears not. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And against? It's carried. Thank you, Christina. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Righty ho. We're going on now to item 22.210, application to a lease site at the Cromwell Wastewater Treatment Plant. Linda, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today I have got a report for you um, proposing a lease over part of the Cromwell oxidation plant site. Um, the lease is um, proposed to be granted to Climate Solutions Aotearoa Limited. 
Um, they are a newly registered company in New Zealand, but they have about 25 years worth of experience in Australia um, working in the e-waste environment. Um, the company proposes to establish a um, worm farm and um, composting um, activity on the site, and they plan to work with the um, Otago Polytechnic, which is just along on the corner from the site. Um, so a lot of gains to be had there um, via that location and making it easy for them to be teaching um, and working with those students. Um, so assuming that everybody has read the report, um, I'll move on to the recommendation that we agree to grant Climate, climate Solutions ART Aroa a lease over approximately one hectare of the Cromwell oxidation plant land um, with an initial term of five years with three rights of renewal of five years each um, at a market rental to be determined by an independent valuer um, and subject to climate solutions Aotearoa obtaining all consents and permits required um, and all other um, conditions uh, that are promoted under the lease. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks Linda. Christina can I just get you to turn your mic off please? You're, we're picking up a bit of background noise. Thank you. Um, now, Shirley, first up. Thank you. Yes, um, I was looking at the map and it looks like there's already build, a building being re leased on that corner of Richards Beach Road in tucked in and it doesn't show on the satellite picture, but I just wondered how close it was and if those people are OK to be neighbours with what's being proposed. Uh, yes, so um, the lease site will work around that space and that is effectively an unmanned site and the activity is not expected to have any effect on the um, on the satellite station. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl. Um, we're in financial considerations. It says a desktop val a rental valuation of $600 including GST per what? Um, uh, is that per annum? Per, per what are we talking? Week, month, year. Um, yeah. We're sorry. Oh, page page three hundred and sixty-two. Yes, that was the cost of the valuation. That wasn't the valuation that's come back. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So. Um, my so the valuation um, just off the top of my head came in at just under $3,000. Um, it has come in since the report was finished and um, the valuation was based on it being an unserviced site. Um, there are services at the boundary and the lessee will be responsible for connecting to the services that they require. Um, it's kind of a catch-22 situation in that once they are established and have connected to those services, it will be um, a serviced site. Um, but the difference then is that when the rent is reviewed in five years, you would anticipate that rent increasing accordingly. But what you might think during that first five year period is that that um, rent would reflect that they are starting from scratch and that they are building themselves up to a, um, a having a serviced and fully functioning business activity on the site um, and then uh, look at obtaining more rent under a market valuation. Thanks. Thank you. Nigel. Thanks Tim. Uh, Linda, just again on rent, we uh, I assume you will have consulted with infrastructure. We are absolutely certain there's no future activity from the existing waste treatment station that would require that land? No, so um, the land there is actually, um, I guess you'd describe it as terraced. So the um, land above the oxidation plant is higher and then it drops over and down to the um, to the oxidation ponds and they are on that lower terrace. So there wouldn't be anything that was required for that purpose to be above the terrace. Thank you. And, can, and just a couple of other questions, if I may. The, the rental, the, the period of lease um, is being proposed is, is quite long. Yes. And um, which maybe reflects the fact that there's no other commercial use 
for that property. But and uh, and unlike other leases, we're not writing in any any short term six months to quit from either party. So no, so we're not anticipating including a cancellation clause, um, and we see the benefit of that site is that um, the the activity is um, consistent with the activity that's already taken place on the site in that while you shouldn't really have any um, odour or smell emitting from either of them, um, they may well do that on occasion and um, because of its location in that area, it's expected to have um, a very minimal amount of impact, if any, on the public. Yeah, which I'm not arguing with, but mm. it's, uh, it does the lease reflect that that's the activities they can, that those are the only activities they can do? They. Oh yes, yes. So the business use will be for a um, worm farm. Um, they're going to have a kiosk and they have people coming and going, dropping things off, picking up vines, um, picking up worm juices, um, making deliveries, um, maybe going to training sessions to learn how to compost and that type of thing. But it will all be consistent with what's there as such and it won't have an effect on the oxidation pond. Thank you. Nigel, Shirley. Thank you. Um, just two more questions. Um, there are some plantings down the roadway on Richard's Beach Road, uh, which have been rather neglected. <clears throat> will there be anything in their lease to, because they will be on the exact boundary, is there anything yes. to ask them to maintain the ground? So Yes, so um, we did actually walk that boundary and take a look at the um, plantings and I would say that the success of the plantings was fairly minimal at the time and what they are proposing is that we pull down the fence which supposedly protects the plantings area and they are going to actually beautify that boundary and include that in their land. So um, I think it might be perhaps a three meter type alleyway that's been um, fenced off between the deer fence boundary and then the second internal boundary which has got the plantings down the center of it um, but the plantings and the um, irrigation hasn't actually been successful and they propose to actually take care of that. Wonderful that sounds good. <clears throat> the second question is um, the road down there is not sealed but a little bit further down, I think it's eco sealed. There's a very small section which is most successful. And if you anticipate a lot more traffic down there, um, yes. is that on the agenda going forward <laughs> um, um, to perhaps eco seal, if not better? I, ha I hadn't um, I hadn't put that into the report as such. But when we were there on site, I did note that um, we had some seal and then the seal um, was ran out and it was gravel. And I did think that um, as the business grows and perhaps as it becomes um, um, busier and there's more people um, going to the site, it may be something that um, we want to consider from a, ro a roading perspective. Um, but perhaps as and when that is necessary. So I'd just like to add there that that road is becoming <clears throat> increasingly popular as at the end if you go around the corner, um, so you go from Tar Seal, the length of the Poo Ponds um, is then gravel, <clears throat> going around the corner it's gravel and a lot of people are now using it as parking for the, doing the cycle trail or walking the cycle trail and dog walking area. So there's a big parking area down the bottom there. So, and if you went straight ahead instead of turning left down there, you'd go up. So there are quite a few, three different surfaces within about, I don't know, less than half a kilometre. <laughs> so right. it's probably a kind of an untidy bit of roadway. So that might form a part of a greater conversation with the roading team. Yeah, just wanted to put, give you a heads up about that, how it's been used. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Shirley. Neil, then Nigel. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a couple of things, I guess, about what Shirley was talking about with the roading. Um, eco seal is generally something that's paid for by the property owners that, that benefit. So um, I'd encourage staff to think about it in terms of any lease we might approve that it actually does provide for the fact that a, a road upgrade is required, that they become a contributor to funding that and not just um, the council. 
Um, and then also noting that once you go down that track to the left towards the lake and get to the um, the start of the cycle track, then the rest of that land that's not fenced and part of the um, part of the um, wastewater treatment plant site is actually part of um, Lake Dunstan itself. Um, what I did want to clarify though was that the lease is effectively for 20 years, five plus 15. So, so we are going to approve a lease for 20 years effectively today because the rights of renewal are pretty much guaranteed as long as all the conditions of the lease are, are met. So that's something to make sure we are mindful of when we give the lease. <clears throat> but what I'm concerned about, if, if we do a lease in terms of how you've worded recommendation B, which is for the purpose of establishing and operating an e-waste collection and material recovery business, I wonder if that includes a worm farm. Um, that's, that is the activity that is the um, e-waste um, activity. That is, it is a worm farm. Effect okay, well, course. effectively it's a worm farm, but it's all about um, the composting and the worm farming and the fines and the selling the worms and um, that uh, also building in that teaching and people coming and they want to grow fruit and veggies, uh, maybe not fruit, veggies, uh, to show people the benefits of the fines, um, etc. So um, e-waste being environmental waste and it's worm farming is how you take, yeah, not electronic waste, e-waste yeah, e being I'm, environmental waste. Yeah, Tame is bang on because um, I thought e-waste to be electronic waste. Um, so I would suggest that we should just make sure that's quite clear that what we mean by the term e-waste, because I think it is probably getting um, um, a different use of terminology there than what might be mm. commonly expected. Um, mm. So it does, it does in the first paragraphs um, expand on e-waste as being environmental waste. Perhaps um, we might want to put that in um, the uh, brackets after the e-waste collection um, in the B of the resolution. Um, I, would, I would go so far as to say it should actually say um, environmental waste and not use the term e-waste. And then in brackets, that is uh, worm farm and associated activities. Then it's quite clear because <coughs> there's a real risk that despite what we've taken it as, if you use a term like e-waste, it just becomes anything I choose to make it. I'm not saying it will, but um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thanks, Tim. Just a further question for clarification, Linda. You've got rent reviews, and then after at the first renewal, there'll yes. be a, should should you actually be talking about a rent reassessment at that first renewal? Because what you've indicated is you've given them uh, a, an under market rent based on the lack of utilities on the site, and the, but your expectation is that on renewal um, that they go to market rent, and maybe yes. the lease should reflect the fact that that first renewal review is actually a reassessment. Um, so the rent the rent review methodology will be will always be market rental um, by valuation of an independent valuer. Um, so uh, while you say that we're giving them an under market at the moment, that um, that lower value is the market value purely yeah. because of the um, state of the land currently. But on um, first renewal, it will be um, reviewed and the methodology is market rental. So um, they have been advised that um, the rent will start at a lesser amount, but have also been advised that um, that, that catch 22 situation whereby yes, yes. once it is serviced and developed, which is what they are going to do themselves, that will be reflected in that market rent on renewal. Yeah, I, I would like to see something that makes that quite explicit. That um, um, well, that, that is explicit. Market rental is the specific uh, market rental at by independent value is very specific for leasing purposes. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that good, Nigel. Shirley. Yeah, sorry, just one more question. Um, we seem to not be giving such long term leases these days, you know, with businesses that's just expected. So I was just wondering why a three plus three or five plus five wasn't considered in this instance. So I know a lot um, of people have been trying to get longer leases and that doesn't seem to have been happening. 
Uh, well, it depends on the case, I guess, but um, the fact of this is that the people are going to be investing quite a considerable sum of money. So if they're going to be investing a business, uh, investing in the business and building that up, um, they don't want to be doing it and thinking that actually they need to vacate the site in um, 10 years or 12 years because it's going to take some significant development um, and significant investment um, in bringing that site up to scratch, putting those services in and having that business operate. Right, thank you. I think there might be a few people who will have raised eyebrows where they've been trying to get longer leases and maybe haven't been, but that was a good explanation. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, can, I add, can I just add to that, Tom? I have no idea who that is, but yes. Yeah, it's Neil, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll just pick up on Shirley's comment about the term of the lease and um, there has been quite a bit of conversation and discussion in the Cromwell area about the terms of leases. When leases have been determined, in other words, when they come to an end, and I think part of it's down to people's understanding of the terminology. We are entering into a proposing to a lease for, for 20 years, of which five is um, pretty much the guarantee, and the other three five-year renewal terms are based on um, the less at E meeting the requirements of the lease. And if they don't, then the council would have the ca case to be able to terminate the lease. After 20 years, the lease is finished. There is no um, obligation, there should be no expectation, and there is no requirement for the council to renew. Equally, there's no, the same applies to the lessee. There's no, works both ways. But these people are entering into a lease potentially for 20 years, and you would think that everything that they are doing in respect to that is factored on a 20 year business case, as every other lessor should do when they're entering into a lease. So there should be no confusion, but Shirley makes a really good point. Typically, people are, um, and dare I say, um, if these guys are a multinational type company, they'll understand that pretty clearly. Whereas, unfortunately, we have a lot of people that are not in that situation who don't know what they don't know, and it does cause some confusion, unfortunately. Could I just add something as an aside that perhaps um, some of the leases which um, you might be referring to surely as um, wanting longer periods are actually leases which have been in place, um, some of them for 20 years and some for longer, but it is, as Neil says, when you come to the end of the term of the lease, um, on expiry, we don't have to um, issue or grant a new lease. And if it is determined that the land under that activity is required for something um, completely different for other purposes, then at that time, that's when you renegotiate whether you have a new lease or whether the people then don't actually hold a right to that land and are required um, to um, move along for want of um, another way of saying that. Um, so yeah, so this isn't an unusual period of the lease, especially with what you or uh, the leases, which I assume that you are referring to um, in the past. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Neil, both for your um, additions to there. Yes, I understand that and I'm in full agreement. I think it's a wonderful um, project and I'd be happy to actually, um, when the time comes, to uh, move that. The time has come, Shirley. Time's come, Shirley. Do you want to move it? A, B, and C? Yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Cool. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Aye. 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 Thanks. That's carried. Thank you very much, Linda. Lovely. Thank you all. Now we have the numbers. Uh, you're number Leanne. Is yeah. Anne joining us or just yourself today? Uh, myself and Kim, Anne's actually on bereavement leave, so um, oh. I'm stepping in for her today. Um, we've got a few people away at the moment. Um, it shouldn't take much. I will take the paper as read and just take you through a few highlights. In regards to the um, financial performance, the key, the key miss, the key difference there is the land sales revenue, and we have actually started receiving that revenue from January onwards, so it's purely a timing issue. Um, plus there is a little bit of land around um, three water subdivision, which will probably progress later in the year at, at Bannockburn. 
you can see the timings out a little bit with the um, Waka Kutahi funding, and that's not unusual because it reflects their funding reflects both operational type costs, but a key component is the road and capital costs, so they often move around a bit. Water meter reading is also um, a timing issue, but that seems to be catching up. We just had a bit of a delay with our contractor. Looking at expenditure, um, we've got a few favourable areas, quite a lot of favourable areas. We've got one area where we're experiencing a um, unfavourable, and that's around our depreciation, and we're doing a bit of work on that, and it reflects the fact that we've got our valuations in after we've set annual plans. What that typically means is, and, and we experience this with pools, is that while we still have to fully depreciate as per the asset, we don't rate fund the full amount as we um, phase that in to try and smooth through the rates increases. Moving on to um, the activities by um, profit and loss by the activities. Pretty much everything I've spoken of in the in the main budget um, variances is reflected there. It just helps um, the elected members see that relationship between income and expenditure and the activity. So you see roading and probably being the two different ones. Looking at capital expenditure, our expenditure year to date, being six months into it, is quite low. We've only spent 21% of the capital expenditure. And we're looking at a forecast as we speak being revised, and that'll give us a feeling for what does this mean for end of year? Is there going to be quite a significant carry forward? And this is where um, we try to juggle what does that mean to our, our cash flow, and obviously it can impact on depreciation and so forth. Um, you can see the big changes there being um, the Cromwell Town Centre. So that's um, my understanding is that program is in the design phase, and that the um, site survey and concept design workshops are being held um, January, February. Um, Information services is around our resource planning um, and financial performance improvements, which is quite a big piece of work. And part of that included trying to get a systems accountant to help us set, get our finance system humming a lot better as we um, try to move to a more user friendly for staff and elected members. Um, and three waters is significantly favourable as well. We've included a new report, um, and this came up at last council meeting, I believe, um, in regards to statement of financial position. How does council know that we've got the cash to fund the reserves that we say are cash reserves? And although we only audit our financial cash reserves at the end, our reserve, cash reserves at the end of the financial year, um, we just wanted to help demonstrate that. So if you look at the column to the far left, you'll see the actuals for 2021. You'll see we have 7 million of council reserves and we have 16.5 of current assets, which is our cash in the bank and our cash investor. So in total, you can see we've got 16 million. And that is to give council that, um, that confidence that when we say we've got reserves, we've got reserves. And then if we go to the annual plan, we had we were sitting around and the annual plan is a really hard one because we actually take the audited annual report reserves, which was the 7 million, and look at what we plan to spend income and expense in during the year. And we thought we we're going to be sitting around 4 million of reserves, and we have more than that in cash. We've got 19, 27, 28 mil. You'll then see when we talk on the reserves shortly on our revised budget, that we're saying we're going to be 10 million deficit of reserves. And then you look down further on our report and you'll see that we are expecting to have 25 million in borrowings, which was always part of our annual plan. Hoping that makes sense. I see there's a question there from Councillor Gillespie, I think. Fire away, Neil. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is pretty simple. Is that loss of information, detailed report, really good. Does anything in your capacity as the executive manager for such matters give you cause to any concern as to this council meeting its targets or objectives in FY22? 
So my only concern is the fact that we have got such a significant underspend in our capital program of work, and that has an impact, in some ways a positive impact on our cash, because we're not going to use as much cash, but it also impacts on the timing. That being said, a big part of that is an infrastructure, and Julie's not here today, but she has spoken a few times to Council on how she's had different programs of work backed up to cover um, the program, and she looks across the three-year time frame particularly with the water stimulus funding. So I have confidence that we are going to meet the targets we've set. And um, you'll see that also in our financial performances shortly, with um, non-financial performances shortly that I'll speak on. Well, Does thank that you answer for... your question? Um, I'm heartened to hear that. And um, your observation about our capital spending is nothing new. Correct. That We're being said, new. we... Um, According to Audit, Audit New Zealand, we actually have done reasonably well over the last few years in comparison to a number of other councils. So I take heart in that. Yep, cool. Thank you. Moving into, um, we have our typical report on internal loans, which is nothing much to report on. Um, forecasting closing balance of just on just over four million. We report on our external loans, which is, is shrinking every time I report on it. We're sitting at just on. 162,000. Reserve table uh, is in the um, a, a well, further in the report. We are at this stage expecting to finish with a deficit, assuming everything got the bulk of it got spent of 10.7 million deficit. And again, that's why we're looking at being in debt with our external loans. Our performance measures are quite hard to, to gauge in, in December, but I did. Um, want to start bringing these so that we're always aware of them and it was asked a couple of years ago to do this once we got our new performance measures put in place with the new long-term plan and it just saves us having a, a surprise at the end of the year if we achieve 70% or 50% or 60% so that you're not feeling why well, wasn't I aware of that. The hardest part of our results is that a lot of our performance measures is reliant on survey results so at December, we haven't done those results. So, um, and it, it's hard for some areas to then guesstimate will they, what will those survey results look like? So we're sibling around 71%, but I believe that um, could be a little bit higher depending on how those survey results come out. And the detail behind that you'll see in the um, further down the report. And what I've tried to do is highlight and read the areas where they're signaling much lower than that they're not going to achieve and put the, um, each manager's put their narrative behind it. Other than that, I'll take the paper as read and happy to answer any other questions. Cool, thanks Leanne. Questions, councillors? Wow. Baffled by too much information maybe? Hopefully not. When? No, I, I don't think so. It's just the reports are increasingly becoming easier to comprehend and the commentary that's coming with them um, basically tells the whole story, I think. Would be my take on it, so take it as a compliment. Stunned yeah. silence. <laughs> Excellent. All right, I'm um, very comfortable in that case to move that the report be received. Somebody will second that. I will. No, Thank no. you, Mitchell. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And against Aye. is carried. Thank you very much, Leanne. Thank you, everyone. Takes us now to page 388, item 22 to 12, and this is our appointments to external bodies, which um, has been a great piece of work that's really rationalised a lot of stuff. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll take the report as read and just remind councillors that there was a workshop held in 2021 with both council and all of the community boards to discuss the current appointments to external committees and to discuss why there were the appointments, um, were they serving their purpose and were there changes to ensure that conflicts of interest were minimised. And so this report is a, is a result of that work and um, really just coming for approval of the recommendations that have been made. I think it's a very good report, Rebecca, because for quite some time there's been confusion in the public and indeed um, I would say amongst elected members that uh, as to what the role is in, in these committees and we've had members, we've had trustees, we've had 
liaison people, it's nice to get some very clear, particularly moving into a new uh, team, a very clear um, line of where we're going. So that was a lot of work between all the boards and everything else. I thank you for it. Is there any questions, um, Council? In that case, I'm very happy to move A, B and C if somebody would second that. I'll do that to Martin here. Thank you, Martin. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And against carried. We have the updated meeting schedule. That is also your paper, Rebecca. Well, yes, I was um, having a look at the meeting schedule and realised that we had planned a council meeting right between Easter and Anzac weekends, and I wasn't sure that that's what everybody had wanted to do. So I am um, proposing that that's, that's moved a week. Um, for staff, I'm not proposing that we move our agenda deadlines. Um, it's just to move the, the meeting out. It will, will shorten up the um, period between the April meeting and the, I think it might be one June meeting, but um, that's just by one week. So yeah, and the other thing that this updated meeting schedule does is um, remove the, I, we had placeholders in there for annual plan hearings that it's that been removed. Excellent. That was a very well um, spotted because a lot of people will quite legitimately take advantage of that um, gap, put a few uh, annual leave days in and um, get a big break. So well done. Um, I'm happy to move and second that. If somebody will, uh, I can't move and second it. I'll move it if somebody will second it. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll second Good. it, Shirley. Thank you, Shirley. All those in favour, aye. Aye. And against. And before you go, Rebecca, I just want to offer a vote of thanks for everything you've done um, in your how many years as our governance manager? Three next week. Three. I was going to say it. We're close <laughs> to three. Um, I, I have been, and I'm sure every member has been hugely appreciative of the rigour that you've put into the role and um, in some regards have knocked us into shape. And particularly um, given the challenges that have come along as has been today with teams. I mean, this has been a very smoothly run operation today as have all of these um, teams things and like anything it's uh, it's what goes on in the background that makes it look easy but it isn't and you do a fantastic job so we wish you well in your new role grateful that you're still at council i understand we may still see you for a bit um, because Ian's going to be uh, wayne rather is going to be a one-man band for a wee while so he's going to call you in but this is your last official uh, time as governance manager so thank you very much thank you Thank you. I've enjoyed working with all of you and, and look forward to continuing to work in my new role. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. All right, that brings us now to my report. Um, it's there in writing, but of course, um, as I do note in it, and I'll come to that first, um, I put there that the I was unsure at the time of writing whether the report from the, um, it's got a big title, the Working Group on Representation, Governance and Accountability of the New Water Services Entities. Um, would be with Minister Mahuta and um, be allowed me to speak um, freely about that report. And that report did um, get released by the Minister last night. It went to her on Monday and released last night. So a pretty good um, effort, really. So I just want to touch on that. Um, I want to talk about the role of the working group first, because my take on this has been that um, my being on this has been taken by some in the community as a sign that this council agrees with the reforms that the government's proposing. And I just want to emphasise that that's absolutely the wrong assumption to make. Uh, my view is barring a change of government, these reforms are going to come into effect mid-2024. Um, there's a lot of councils putting a lot of ratepayer money, time and effort into trying to change the government's mind about the reforms. I've um, sat in a room on a number of occasions with Minister Mahuda. Sometimes that room's only had a small number of people in it, and I don't believe for a moment that her mind's going to be swayed. Um, and uh, I don't see these reforms not happening. Um, if, if, the, if the success for the groups that are trying to change the government's minds, well, that's well and good. But the view that I took on um, accepting the offer to be on the working group was that if the reforms do go ahead, um, as is being planned at the moment, changes needed to be made to them to make them better for the people of Central Otago and New Zealand now and into the future. And I really want to recognise my fellow councillors um, for supporting me in doing this because I know I've taken a lot of flack. A lot of people have read it the wrong way, um, looking at it as 
capitulation, giving in, supporting whatever. Um, I really appreciate the the support I've had from councillors. Uh, it's been a lot of work, and um, it's been it's been great. And as I say, um, thinking that my being on this group is a sign that the council supports the reforms would be incorrect. And we will be um, following up. Uh, we put an advertisement in the paper, an open letter to our community, either the end of last year, or the but the end of last year, I think. And we'll be following that up again, um, following on from what's come out of this um, report. So um, essentially the terms of reference that we were put under were very tight. They, they, they gave us very little room to manoeuvre. Um, so I have had people email me say, great, you're on this uh, committee. You can now uh, make the reforms go away, uh, which certainly wasn't the case. We had four main criteria we had to stick to, being we had to maintain good governance. Uh, that was good. Um, obviously you want that. Uh, we had to maintain balance sheet separation, which meant that the entities, whatever idea we came up with, the entities still needed to be able to borrow at the best possible rate on their own account. Um, and we had three meetings, I think, with Standard & Poor's to try to figure out what that meant uh, for different models, although Standard & Poor's were unable to, for understandable reasons, um, give us a very clear indication of yes or no, because it would really come down to the detail. Uh, the third thing was that the government's views as to responsibilities under the Treaty of Waitangi would be maintained. In other words, the 50% governance um, uh, that was going to iwi to be shared with councils would be changed. We couldn't interfere with that. And fourthly, that um, risks and measures to be taken against the risk of privatisation must be maintained as well. Um, I'm sure that, well, there is in the media uh, the outcomes of it. Uh, just to touch on probably the highlights for me is firstly a um, there was a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of absolutely deliberate misinformation um, put into the public, which filled the gap of an absolutely appalling um, and virtually well, worse than useless um, advertising campaign by the government to explain the reforms. But anyway, a lot of misinformation went around that said that uh, iwi or Maori were getting gifted half of the water infrastructure. Uh, by government as a consequence of these reforms. Just to emphasise two things. One, that was never the case. Uh, never in the government's model has it had iwi getting given or having any ownership um, of the water infrastructure. It was just a complete fabrication. Secondly, I think now between discussions with Naitahu as one of the South Island mayors and working with iwi on this governance group, I've probably clocked up 100 hours of more of meetings with iwi about the three waters and the only time that um, ownership has ever been mentioned by iwi has been when they've said we want nothing to do with it. Uh, iwi is going to have greater influence um, than has been the case in the past and frankly I don't see a problem with that. Um, they, the iwi have a lot to offer and also I don't think I've heard iwi say anything that most New Zealanders in relation to te mana otoai, the, um, the mana of the water, that most, if not all New Zealanders, wouldn't agree with. So there's been a big red herring there and an economic and environmental problem has been turned into a race issue by some. And it's a real sad um, indication in our nation that that's happened. Anyway, in the law um, was drafted by the government that the entity, so in our case, Entity D, would be owned by the, um, would be owned, sorry, Entity D would own the infrastructure, so our pipes, our wastewater treatment plants and so forth. But we, as one of the 20 councils in that um, entity, would own the entity. So there was a line in the in the um, draft bill that said Entity D or Southern Entity, I think it's called, um, will be owned by Chat, Central Otago District Council, Clutha District Council, Queenstown, Dunedin and so forth. What we've um, put in the recommendation to the minister is that isn't good enough. And there's a number of reasons for this. One, uh, so where we're going with it is that there will be a shareholding. There's a recommendation of a shareholding. Really important, the shareholding only goes to ownership, not to um, anything such as greater influence or anything like that. Um, for every 50,000 people or, um, or, or, or part thereof, you get one share. So Central Otago District Council will get one share. Dunedin with our 24,000 people, Dunedin with the 117 get three shares. Doesn't really matter that much. Um, but it does actually give a sense of ownership, hopefully, to people who felt they'd been dispossessed of ownership. It will also re-engage that conversation and the misinformation will be challenged, as I've talked about. 
The thirdly is probably the most important bit because alongside that, we've also recommended that there must be a vote, a 100% vote of the um, shareholders in the entity before the entity can be sold. Because one of the biggest issues that I've got with this whole thing is um, the risk of privatisation further down the track. And it's certainly probably number two on the list of concerns that come to me. Um, the other thing is the um, the way that the representative group, the regional representative group will be structured is being changed for a third time, or it's proposed to. You'll recall that when the government first put out their model, they had um, a regional representative group that had six council and six iwi representatives on it that sit above the actual board that runs the company. The um, problem that was raised by councils with that is, well, how am I going to get a seat on that board if there's only six and we've got 20 of us in our entity? Um, so the government, to my view, somewhat inexplicably in the draft exposure bill changed it to you can have as many seats on the board, on the representative group as there are councils. So in entity D, if we wished, we could have 20 councils with a person on the board. Uh, there would be a corresponding number of iwi, I keep saying board, I should say group, regional representative group. Um, there'd be 20 iwi and you would have a, a, a governance body of 40 people, which is madness. Um, that we have recommended gets pulled back to 12 or 14 in the case of Entity D. That's just to do some um, numbers with Auckland's behemoth size and amongst all of that. Um, and that we would have feeder, we would have sub-regional representative groups going up that would allow, for instance, and, and it's going to be up to each entity how it organises this, not the entity itself, but up to the regional representatives how they organise it. But it may be that there is maybe, I emphasise maybe, a Southland Otago, Canterbury, Christchurch, West Coast. Five feeder groups, each of those would have one person on the regional representative group. Um, you may not be at the top table, there may not be a Central Otago rep on the RRG, but there will be a Central Otago rep on the sub RRG, which will make sure if you're not at the top table, you're at the table right next door, making sure that your community voice is being heard, which is really important for me, representing a community of 24,000 people when you're facing Christchurch with 378,000 or whatever it is. The other thing that we've put in, and I know I've been talking for quite a while, is a um, recommendation for a water ombudsman. It's been particularly concerning to me that we have uh, the potential in years to come where somebody will be having a problem with their bill. Um, no use ringing the mayor or the councillor anymore. It'll be as much use as ringing about your um, power bill, probably. Maybe slightly not quite so bad because we will be shareholders, but realistically, we're not going to be able to pick up the phone and do much. There needs to be an independent body that's going to help individuals, and that's where the ombudsman uh, comes in. There's still a couple of factors I'm not happy about. One in particular, well, in terms of the governance model, um, the regional representative group will now directly appoint the board. Um, I intend to make that part of a submission to the select committee when this bill comes forward. I think that that leaves the door wide open to political meddling in the board. And one thing that I've been consistent on across the many hours of meetings of this representative group is there can be no political meddling from either um, side of the representative group um, when it comes to the board. They have to be there on merit. If these reforms are going to go ahead, then that board has to be as sharp as possible because if they're not, it's just going to cost our people a whole lot more money into the future. So um, I've got some other things on my mayoral report uh, that probably don't need to be um, commented on too much. Uh, the only other thing I'd add is um, really big roadworks going on around uh, Cromwell. I recognise that's causing a lot of pain for the community or sorry, that's not causing pain, let's be realistic. It's causing a lot of inconvenience for the community but um, it's going to be fantastic when they're finished. Uh, I think they're going to be really good. So look, I've, um, I've talked for a long time. I need to have a sip of water. If anyone's got any questions or comments. Um, st Nigel, standardised charging part of the working group's brief. It wasn't, but, and, and I have to admit, I haven't read fully the last draft because you and I discussed this last night. At the last meeting, I said that standardised charging within each entity had to be in there and it was agreed. I've been wrapped up with media and other things and haven't read the full report um, in, in its entirety yet, but I haven't picked up on it. So we'll be following that up because if it's not there, it absolutely needs to be. That's the premise upon which the whole thing was based. And I should have figured that out last night, but I ran out of time, sorry. Anyone else? Your Worship. Neil. Who's that? Neil. 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 Hello. Um, uh, 
I know you're probably in a bit of all the road groups that are going on, and you know, I want to just raise in particular the, the, the extensive road groups with two roundabouts going in and Cromwell on 8B at the Vets Corner. But someone called it Nichols Corner the other day. I'm not sure if they if they had been here long enough to say that it's in the Vets Corner. Um, and the Barry Avenue section. And I've observed this before is that I, th I had to note that Waka Katohi's um, communication about the changes in the detours and stuff has been, um, I would like to say, abysmal in terms of um, engaging with the community and telling them what's happened. And it just seems to be that from what I'm picking up is you, if you don't read it on social media, you're not going to know so little about it. Um, and then you might, because the, the local media might pick it up off social media and put it in the newspaper a week or so later, um, which I find totally unhelpful. Now, what, what amazes me out of all that is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of community community angst about it all this. People are sucking it up and getting on with it, which is great. That's really good. But I, I do have to say that I think that the, the, when we've got such extensive networks in Central Otago to communicate with our, our people, and we know as the council we've got them, um, I just wish other organisations would take a leaf out of that book and, and use those publications to tell me what's happened. You know, in case in point, I can't work out why I had to read on a social media post that now all traffic going um, north from the Wanaka end of State Highway 6 has to go through uh, Shortcut Road uh, and 8B and turn left at the Vets Corner. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong. I have no view about the right and wrong of it because it's all about construction. I just think that there's um, a, a, a far better activity could be done. And I probably should have asked first whether staff were involved in any conversations around it, but suspecting because it's State Highways, I'd imagine they were probably told, if at all. So you yeah, make that observation and, and you know, hopefully um, the community continue to um, accept what um, they're having to put up with and, and how they're being informed about it all. Yeah, I think our roading team have gone, but I take your point, Neil, um, to read it through a Queenstown blogger is um, frustrating, to say the very least. Yeah. All right, anyone else, any comments on the report? Otherwise, I'm quite happy to move it and move us on. So I'll move that. Somebody second it? Yeah, Neil. Thank you, Neil. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Thanks very much. OK, on to our status reports. This is at page 401. Um, now, we've got quite a number of these here, so we want to note each of them in turn. So our forward work program is at Appendix 1. So you'll find that on page 402. Anyone got any comments? There's nothing too major there. Just um, don't worry about putting your hand up because I won't be able to see you. Just whistle out if you've got anything you want to say. So I take it that the um, forward work program people are happy with. Thank you. The um, Central Otago District Council at a glance I found really helpful. Um, it was, uh, you know those numbers, but it's awfully nice to have them all in one place. Any comments on that? I think it'll be good to probably try and um, make sure that that was um, something the community were aware of and could um, you know, use their own reference document. Yeah, I think so. It is a very useful um, piece of work. The organisational business plan um, looks extremely good. Very, uh, it's remarkable that such a large organisation can be put into something so concise. So well done on that. Um, any issues with that, anybody? Tim, could I just go back to the at a glance and wonder if some hard copies are put in the libraries and the service centre? Why not? It's been a good, good, a good idea. Thank you. Take, take that on board. Um, that's a really good idea, Shirley. Status reports. Um, all right, just lost some place for a moment. Any issues on any of those status reports? I know I'd highlighted one of them, so just bear with me while I try to find it. I had a question about. Um, major event funding, Tim. Yes. And my question is, why is that status? Why is that status report in confidential? Because my memory of this when it came before council last year is that there was nothing in that report that was that reflected any business need for business confidentiality at all. What page are you on, Nigel? Pardon? 
What page? Uh, page 482. So that would be part of our confidential meeting? That's yeah. correct. So maybe we'll come to that later. Oh, sorry, I've got to hear myself. Yeah, okay. no, the wrong status reports. All good. They all look yeah. the same. Um, so clean, that's all. Yeah, I can't, I can't pick up what it was I had. I think it was a question I answered myself. Any other questions in relation to these status reports? Yes, yeah, it's, it's good, Your Worship, that we're going through them, uh, what's attached to those governance reports, which is good. Um, in the status reports, uh, there's a, um, I guess in the end, we get consumed by a lot of information. And I'm just wondering, and, and, and Sancho, I can see you now saying, he dare not say what he's going to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> whether, um, so we don't miss it. The highlights might be pointed out to us if they're appropriate. So I'm using that word to say if they're appropriate. If it's just BAU and there's nothing, no drama, you know, no no issue. But um, I'm, I'm just mindful that there's always a risk that we'll miss something that's actually important. Um, and I know the owner should be on us to read it all, but when you're sitting with a, a 503 page agenda, um, that's not always going to be the case. So just maybe just something to think about um, that we're appropriate that if there's something in there that maybe within the, um, the, the covering governance report, um, any key things could be just um, highlighted where appropriate. Okay, with that, Madam CEO. Sorry, I was just finishing with my eyes rolling. No, not at all. Um, Neil, that's totally, totally appropriate. But what I would propose is instead of duplicating it by writing it twice, is that um, the staff member presenting the governance what could perhaps say if there's anything of significance that I think we should yeah. draw your attention to. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just mindful that your good work that's being done to produce those reports could be overlooked by us because we're faced with large agendas that despite best efforts, we might miss something. 100% understand. Thank you. Um, we're now up to the planning and environment status report on 426. No one's got any issues with that? Um, infrastructure services on 431. Any issues? And the status report on the resolutions from the CEO at 434. No issues. So I'm going to move we receive all of those status reports before I come to the community board minutes. Uh, would somebody second that, please? Uh, right. Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you, Cheryl. All those in favour? All right. Aye. Aye. Against, carried. Um, just pause for a moment. Just while I get myself in order here. Um, Wait, Louise. Um, sorry, I put something in the chat there. I just wondered, um, given that you had Wayne Dixon at the public forum, are you all comfortable where the um, Cromwell Aerodrome one landed? And so what it says is representatives from the equestrian club spoke at the council meeting on 26 January. At this meeting, council did not indicate any change in direction from the agreed resolution. Officers are now intending to give effect to the resolution. Yeah, well, certainly nothing's come up through uh, through any councillors. I'm I'm comfortable. But thank you for raising that, though. I, anyone have any particular issue with it? No. Okay, I think we're still okay with our. Um, just receiving them in that case. Thank you, though. Right, thanks. Right, we've got the minutes of the Vincent, and I think we've got the minutes of all of our boards. Anything of a particular um, issue there? We have the minutes of the Audit and Risk Committee as well. Um, and that would be that. So I'll move those um, community board minutes and committee minutes be uh, received. Somebody second, please. Martin here, Tim. Thank you, Martin. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Aye. Carried. Date of our next meeting is 20th of April, and today has gone very well, but gee, I hope we're all together by then. Sorry, it's the 27th of April, following the... Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, could we note that in the minutes, please? That was a very good <laughs> last trick there, Rebecca. Well done. 
I couldn't put the new date. I couldn't presume to no, make a decision for you. <laughs> <laughs> well done. All right, thank you very much, everybody. We're going to um, move into non-public now. Before I move the resolution to do that, for any members of the public who have um, sat through the meeting or part of it today and are still with us, thank you very much. For those of you who may be watching it um, on delayed or recorded, um, thank you very much. And always remember that you're most welcome to get in touch with myself or any of the councillors, should there be anything from this that you wish to discuss. So I'll move that we move into a, a confidential meeting for the reasons outlined on 474 onwards. Would somebody second that, please? Yeah. Thank you, Neil. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And against, carried. Thank you.